morning, I'm going to ask you to turn to uh, Psalm chapter 36, and I would encourage you, if you're those of you who are at home, to go ahead and turn there as well. Uh, last week, I took mostly a topical approach and uh, told you that it would be hard to keep up, but this morning, we're going to spend most of our time in Psalm 36 and preach a little bit more like I normally would, and so I would encourage you to get out your Bibles and follow along. And my plan is to uh, work through this psalm over two or three sessions. I'm, I'm going to try to keep the time reasonable. I know that doing this at home, uh, sitting down and watching a screen, uh, will have its challenges, especially with some of the little ones. And so I'll try to be mindful of that and still give us some time here in the Word. I'm going to go ahead and read Psalm 36 and then... We will take a look at the first section this morning, and this morning we're talking about the kind of people that God saves, and I think it's encouraging because we're going to actually be talking about wicked people, and it's the kind of people that God saves, but we're also going to be looking at God's merciful, loving kindness to us. All right, are you there? Psalm 36. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord. An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flatters himself in his own eyes when he finds out his iniquity and when he hates. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He devises wickedness on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not abhor evil. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, and let not the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the workers of iniquity have fallen. They have been cast down and are not able to rise. Now, there is something in particular that actually drew me to this psalm a while back. I have found that um, I don't always have a wonderful gift of recalling an exact passage or a reference or scripture. Sometimes I do. I memorized a lot of verses when I was younger, especially, and sometimes they come to mind, but, but sometimes I don't remember stuff. And so what I was doing is I was trying to gather some passages that would especially be helpful for difficult situations, things like crisis counseling or going to the hospital because somebody is dying or somebody has just passed away or somebody is ready to go into a, a major surgery and they're scared. And I thought, what are some of the passages that would be especially helpful for times like that? And it was in that process that I was reminded of this psalm, and this has kind of become my go-to psalm. Some of you might know this because I've read this uh, part of this passage in your hearing, maybe when you've been in the hospital or when you needed a word like this. But what you might not have known is that I've been reading this passage to a lot of people, especially verse 7 that says, How precious is your loving kindness, O God! 
Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. Now, because I am taking my time to go through this psalm, we're not going to be focusing especially on that passage this morning, but I want you to know that's where we're headed, and, and that's the beauty of this, of this text that has drawn me to it in ministry many times in the past. The setting is David thinking about the contrast between wicked people and God's people, which included David. But what we'll see is that while the trouble sometimes changes, whether it's specifically wicked men who are trying to do us in, which was the case for David, or whether it's COVID-19 and the difficulties that we face in this day, I'm not saying those are exactly the same thing, but the middle passage of this psalm remains the same. God is who he is. He doesn't change. He is filled with mercy, and his loving kindness is precious. And we are invited, in a sense, in this text to find our shelter under the shadow of his wings. And there's a physical imagery there we'll look at when we get there in this psalm, but I think even more so spiritually, we need to remember the safety that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ for all who are in him. But there are a lot of good things in this psalm for us in our present context. I'm going to begin this morning by talking a little bit about the description that David gives of these wicked men and the contrast that there is between them and God and even God's people and what God, the work that God has done in his people. But let's look at this description of wicked men, it's particularly found here in verses 1 through 4. The first couple verses uh, of the psalm say a couple of things about this wicked person's condition. In one, verses 1 and 2, you can see they have a sinful heart condition. And, and what I mean by that is not physical, it's, it's spiritual. The, the Word of God talks a lot about our hearts, uh, the condition of our hearts, what's going on inside of them, the, the sin that influences the other things that we think and, and do. But the, the root of the problem, the real difficulty, starts in our hearts. We just read that, that the problem is described as there is no fear of God before their eyes, which is a common descriptive term in Scripture for those who don't know God. And it also says that he flatters himself in his own eyes when he finds out his iniquity and when he hates. So there are a couple of issues here that are a part of this sinful heart condition. First of all, the, the wicked man doesn't fear God, doesn't really care what God thinks, doesn't really care who God is or who he says he is, and essentially denies his existence, or at least lives as if God didn't exist. And in doing that, certainly denies God's authority. Now, we know from the scriptures that God created everything, and we are accountable to him by virtue of that fact. But the wicked man, whether or not he would say he believes in God, he lives as if God's authority does not exist. Everything is backwards here from the way it should be. God, who should be feared in a sense, respected, um, we understand he's our creator and we're accountable to him. That is not the reality for the wicked man. And instead of seeing himself as he really is, as sinful and needy and guilty before God, he sees himself as much, much better. So he lacks the fear of God and he lacks humility. When you think about it, humility, I think maybe we've defined it that way before, haven't we? That humility is really having an understanding of who we are in light of who God is. It's having a, a proper understanding according to truth. Humility is not really just self-abasement or you know, saying certain things about yourself to demean yourself. Humility is having a proper understanding of who we are in light of who God is. Well, the wicked man doesn't fear God or understand himself. 
having removed God, the wicked man replaces God with himself. Spurgeon put it like this, He who makes little of God makes much of himself. They who forget adoration fall into adulation. The eyes must see something, and if they admire not God, they will flatter self. What he's saying is, if we don't have a proper adoration of our Creator, then we're going to have kind of a a, a freakish self-love where we have to try to heap praise upon ourselves to make up for the fact that we're not worshiping the God who created us. I think it was helpful uh, the way the ESV puts verse 2. He flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. In other words, the person who lacks humility is one who flatters himself. And I think at the heart of that is really somebody who is convincing his own conscience, convincing her own conscience that her behavior is acceptable when it's rebellion against God. So I'm sinning against the God who made me, but I'm convincing myself that I'm okay or I'm not that bad. I'm better than others. And we tend to think of ourselves as much better than we actually are. But there is a reality, David says, there's a a reality that goes beyond the appearance. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but sometimes when I've been working on my house, you might come across uh, a board that's painted, and for some reason you, you feel like something needs to be investigated, or maybe you're working on something else, and you know how that goes. You start working on this, and this is connected to that, and before you know it, you have three projects instead of one. Have you ever pushed on a board that was painted and it looked great, but then you realized it's actually disintegrating underneath? It's rotten? The paint was still holding up, (laughs) but all you were really seeing was that facade of paint, and when you really push on the thing, it's just rotten and um, breaking apart underneath. That's kind of what the wicked person is like. They, they think a lot about their exterior, what they look like, how they come across. And I, and I think naturally we even convince ourselves, we lie to ourselves that we're not really that bad. We're not really breaking God's law. There is no God anyway. And we're not really, um, especially compared to a lot of other people out there, we're really not that bad off. Or to change the analogy It's like cracking open an egg that's rotten. You are all ready to fry it up, and uh, you open it up, and you're not going to eat a rotten egg. And that's kind of what it's like for a wicked person who, maybe they're even doing good works, you know, maybe they're even doing good things, but having forgotten God and flattered themselves that they're in much better position than they really are, there's just a facade, but underneath there's a true condition that needs to be revealed. By the way, uh, thank you, Mrs. Couch, for those eggs. I, I, I'm actually preaching on the fuel of those farm-fresh eggs here this morning, and they were not rotten on the inside. They were very good. The yolk was especially yellow. Uh, thank you. It was good. Well, this wicked person has not only a sinful heart condition, but if you have a sinful heart condition, then that just leads to the rest. Verses 3 and 4 talk about what I'm going to call a sinful hand condition. Now, no, I'm not talking about somebody who hasn't washed their hands or hasn't disinfected their hands. That's not what I mean by sinful hand condition. (laughs) What I'm talking about is somebody who has a sinful heart and continuing on in rebellion against God, um, it just is going to come out. And so what they think and then what they do is going to be a result of what's going on inside. Look at verse 3. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He devises wickedness on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not abhor evil. So the wickedness of someone's heart 
ends up being the wickedness of their hands, their, their tongues, their minds, the things that they think, the things that they plot back behind closed doors to do things that will benefit themselves even if they harm other people. You know, it's interesting. When you look at a passage like this, I'll be honest that there are times I look at a passage like this, and especially when David contrasts it with God, and, and I'm thinking to myself, wicked man and a merciful God. Now you say to yourself, well, what's wrong with that? That's what the passage is talking about. Do you know, I think that as we read a text like this, what we have to understand is, yes, there is such a thing as people who are still living in wickedness, contrasted with the Lord's people who struggle with remaining sin, but God has done a fundamental work of changing their hearts and their desires. There is a real contrast there. But I think it's helpful for us to remember that, that we really all started out like the, you know, verses 1 through 4. That's who we are apart from Christ, and, and it's even possible for us when we sin as believers to live in such a way, at least for a time, that looks more like verses 1 through 4. So my point is, as we read this, instead of thinking about those wicked people, if you don't know Christ and you're listening this morning, this actually describes you. And for those of us who know Christ, there's still a warning here to say, let's not fall back because there's a decision that believers have to make that we have a decision of whether we're going to live like verses 1 through 4 or live like God's people. And sometimes we do that more than living like God's people. So I want us to think more of, of this, not as distanced from us, way out there, those wicked people, but think about it as, you know, the true condition of somebody's heart outside of Christ, this is it. In fact, you know, um, when we were preaching through Romans, and we were looking at Romans 3 concerning what we often call total depravity, not that man is as wicked as he could possibly be, but that every part of man has been thoroughly corrupted and he has no real spiritual desire toward God apart from the Holy Spirit. When we looked at that doctrine in Romans 3, we actually went to a couple of other psalms because the first part of Psalm 14 and the first part of Psalm 53 are almost identical, and we quoted it in Romans 3, which Paul does. We, we looked at that when Paul quoted it in Romans 3 in our study of that chapter. Listen to the first three verses of Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. You see, Paul takes that description and he says, it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, this describes man's heart apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there was a particular context in which this wickedness interacted with, with David, and David had to truly struggle with wicked men. Uh, a while back, uh, we looked at some of these things. I'm going to just recap it for you, um, but I think we, we've looked at this before as we've remembered some of what David struggled with in his life, and um, I would, you know, if you want to call it ministry, <laughs> ministry of serving as a king and writing psalms and leading God's people. He had some ridiculous struggles compared to most of us. And, and I do think that when you see David writing Psalm 36, there is a context here of things that have happened to him and, and what he's thinking about. These events were very difficult, and some of them, many of them, potentially deadly. And a lot of this can be found in First and Second Samuel. Kids, do you remember um, the story? Of course you do. David and Goliath? I mean, who doesn't remember that one, right? I wish I could hear some of you kids saying, yes, we remember. I, I can't hear you, but I hope some of you acknowledge that. 
But do you remember David and Goliath? That, that's kind of how David's life starts as far as the record of Scripture is concerned. He was a young man, and you remember he fought and killed Goliath when no Israelites would step up, and that was kind of our introduction to David. Well, I don't have time to go through all of these accounts, but just listen to some of them. Saul twice, remember King Saul? He twice tries to kill David with a spear. Saul's older daughter, Mirab, is promised to David and then given to Adriel, the Mohalathite. Saul promises another daughter, Michael, if David would only go and kill a hundred Philistines. So David kills 200 of God's enemies. But then, even with all of that, David and Saul become enemies and Saul tries again to take David's life. David fights against the Philistines. Jonathan helps David escape the king's hand. David flees to the Philistines and then to the king of Moab where he placed his parents and family for safety. I want you to notice as I'm going through this, David is actually bouncing back and forth between taking shelter with Israel's enemies and actually fighting Israel's enemies. Sometimes he is enjoying the friendship of a guy like Jonathan, who is of the nation of Israel, but Jonathan's father, who is also of the nation of Israel, is the one hunting David down. Sometimes David has enemies everywhere, his own people and his people's enemies. Do you remember the account where Saul murders 85 priests after accusing them of helping David? Saul chases David through the wilderness. David actually spares Saul's life more than once. And David makes an alliance with the Philistines and lives in their land. This is kind of a quick chronology of, of David's struggles. The Amalekites raided and took David's wives captive, and David had to go after them and get his family back. Saul and his sons died in battle against the Philistines, and David becomes king, but first only over Judah. The family of Saul is fighting against the family of David at this point, and Abner makes Ishbosheth king over Israel while David is king over Judah. Ishbosheth is murdered, and David reigns over all Israel, or the United Kingdom. Well, not Great Britain, but you know, Judah and Israel. Well, after this, he faces war with the Philistines, the Syrians, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Amalekites, to name a few. Well, then in the midst of all this, you remember that later on in his life, David sins with Bathsheba and has Uriah murdered. I think you could kind of say when a king has somebody do something for him, it's kind of like the king's doing it. And so I think we could rightfully say David murdered Uriah. And these sins resulted in the loss of one of David's own sons. Well, then you say, isn't that enough? But toward the end of his life, David's son Absalom murdered David's son Amnon. And then Absalom makes a run for the throne, committing treason against his own father. David runs for his life, and Absalom is killed. And then it's back to war with the Philistines. Now you can see why David would write some psalms where he was looking to the Lord to help him process the wickedness that some showed him. We should not discount or, or downplay wickedness. We should call wickedness what it is. Murder, lying, manipulation, deceit. It's sinful. And it's an abomination to God. I don't know exactly when David wrote this psalm, but he clearly had lots of experience with the transgression of the wicked. But you know, 
when you look at Psalms like Psalm 51, which is how he repented after his own sin, you, you get the sense that while David certainly at times were, he was asking God for deliverance and mercy from wicked men who wanted to do him in, you also get the sense as you read the Psalms that David was well aware of some of his own sin. Even as a child of God, he was aware of some of his own heinous sin. Now, it was sin that could be forgiven by God, and that's a beautiful truth. But you get the sense as you read the Psalms that, that David struggled with remaining sin in his own heart, even though he was a follower of God. And we know his life was, as we've just described, was filled with stress from struggles, not only with the enemies of Israel, but also with unbelieving men who were children of Israel, as we've already pointed out. So when we read a passage like this, I think one thing we should do is say, wickedness is wickedness. Let's not be afraid to call sin, sin, because it's really God who is calling it sin. God is the one who calls rebellion sin. God is the one who has said, if we continue on in rebellion, then we will face his just judgment. I also think when we read a passage like this, there ought to be a sense in which God helps us to hate our own sin. You know, any way in which we as God's people, although our sins are completely washed clean and we stand justified in his holy presence, there's still a sense in which when we sin, it looks a lot like these first four verses. And we ought to have a, a holy sense of hatred develop in our own hearts for anything in our own lives that still looks like this. Now, I'm preaching this psalm in the context of our current struggle with COVID-19. And I want you to understand that I'm not trying to make some really close parallel here between these first four verses and the exact circumstances of our current day. I mean, it's true that when you go through something like we're going through right now as a nation, it's true. You see righteousness on display. You see wickedness on display. You see wisdom on display. You see foolishness on display. And, and sometimes I think you can see that God's grace is such that there can be an element of wisdom coming from people that don't actually know Christ. But I'm not going to try to make some sort of series of close parallels. All I'm going to say is this. David went through some really stressful things, and it was helpful for him to focus his attention on the mercy of his God. And that's what we're, what we're going to do a little bit today and then even more next time, is we're going to focus on our merciful God in the midst of whatever it is that's causing immense stress. In the midst of whatever it is. And that's the thing that's beautiful about the Psalms and about a passage like this, and that is that verses 5 through 9 don't change whatever the difficult situations happen to be that we're facing. But you know, we are reminded with the struggle that we're currently facing, that we live in a fallen world that's groaning under the curse of sin, and that this world is still uh, full of people described by the first four verses of this psalm. Well, as I've mentioned, when you look at the first four verses of Psalm 36... And you see how similar that is with the first three verses of Psalm, um, what was it that I just read? 14, Psalm 14, as well as the almost identical passage in Psalm 53. You see how similar those are? And how Paul quotes those passages in Romans 3? <laughs> what we really see here is a description of man's natural condition. It's really who we are and what's in our hearts apart from Christ. We all need to repent. You know, I entitled this sermon, The Kind of People God Saves, and I was talking about the first four verses. God does not save people who are naturally good because they don't exist. 
There are people who think that they're good. There are self-righteous people who are trying to accomplish salvation their own way. But there are no naturally good people who don't need Christ. And so the kind of people that God saves are the people in the first four verses of this psalm. This is a description of man's natural condition. We all need to repent. And I was, I was thinking about Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus about some of these same realities in John chapter 3. Now, kids, you know John chapter 3, don't you? Because if nothing else, you know John 3.16, that God so loved the world. But the context of that is that Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, who's he talking to? People that the world would consider to be wicked? He's talking to Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Jews, a spiritual religious leader of the Jews. Don't know that he actually knew Christ in a saving way at this point, but he was a a leader and a ruler of the people in religious and spiritual things. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. Because whether or not it all made its way out, Nicodemus, like all of us by nature, would be described by these first four verses of Psalm 36. We're all in need of a spiritual rebirth where the Holy Spirit brings new life and our sins are washed clean and forgiven. And it's in that context where we read those familiar verses. I'm actually going to read John 3, 16, and then a few verses after that. Listen, and try to not let the familiarity of it lessen its meaning. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Doesn't that sound like Psalm 36, 1 through 4? But it's for people like that. It's for wicked people. It's for people who are rebelling against God and that's all of us by nature before Christ. It's in that context that Jesus says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If we have not believed in Jesus, our condition before God is that we are sinful, we are guilty, and we are condemned, just like Psalm 36, 1 through 4. But, Jesus says to Nicodemus, if we believe in him, we are not condemned, but rather our sins are forgiven and we are freed from guilt. You know, we are far more in need of forgiveness from God than we are of protection from COVID-19. I'm not saying to be careless about COVID-19, What I am saying is that our spiritual lives are forever, and this current situation is not. Now, this psalm is not just a contrast between a merciful God and sinful men. It is a description of a merciful God who is forgiving to sinful men when they come to him in repentance. In other words, we're not just talking about those wicked men and then David, God's man. No, we're talking about David who was like that and was saved, was forgiven. We're talking about those of us who were like that 
And, and now we're not by God's grace, but not because of our goodness, but because of God's great love and mercy. This psalm is a description of a merciful God who is forgiving to sinful men when they come to him in repentance. And David would have understood that even while he was praying for protection from those who would kill him. Because he goes on to write, and this is where we're heading in this psalm. Look at the first part of verse 5. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. And you know, David writes that not as one who is just stating something that is theologically correct. David is writing this as a man after God's own heart, as the scriptures describe him. David is writing this as one who has been a recipient of God's mercies. He himself has been changed from a wicked man to a follower of God and one who has been forgiven and is no longer condemned. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. It doesn't matter if we're struggling with wicked people or with a widespread illness, the glory of this middle section that we're going to look at next time, the glory of it is that God remains the same and he is worthy of our trust. And that's what, if God wills, we'll look at next time we're in this study. Now, I know these are difficult days, and maybe this is something that I can suggest for you even uh, this next week. We need to fill our minds with good things. We need to fill our minds with God's truth. We've talked about the need that we have to fill our homes with, with God-honoring music. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not saying every song has to be about Christ, but let's make sure maybe that some of our songs are songs about Christ, and we're being reminded of the hope and the comfort that we have in Him. Because I think in these days, that comfort and that hope is not necessarily going to just be there when we're watching the press conference or the latest news. We need to intentionally, as I said at the church family chat online for Arbor Church the other day, we need to intentionally set our affections on things above in these days. And one way we could do that, I want to encourage you, even if you're not able to join us next time, whenever next time might be, I, I want to encourage you to meditate this week on Psalm 36, 5 through 9. It's glorious, it's true, it's comforting, and it will fill your mind and your heart with glorious truth of our great God. And that's the section we're going to begin to look through by God's grace the next time that we're together. Let's pray. Our Father God, our prayer this morning is that you would be merciful to us, just like that verse we just read. Lord, that you are a God of mercy. Your mercy is in the heavens. There's no bound to it. We pray for some who perhaps would still be more described by those first four verses, that you would show them their sin. Maybe, Lord, even using the current circumstances to, to cause them to think about their spiritual state in ways that they wouldn't otherwise. And I pray that those listening today, Lord, would be brought to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ if they're not followers of Christ. And for those of us who know you, Lord, we can thank you. We can thank you that your mercy has come to us and changed us. Your forgiveness has cleansed us. And while sometimes we still struggle with sin that remains, there is a fundamental change and difference in the hearts and lives of your people. And that change has made us lovers and followers of God. And it has changed our hearts and how we think, and what we say, and how we live. So, Lord, we pray that in these days you would help us to think and speak and live like your people. And that we would even be able to, in some way, be the hands and the feet of the Lord Jesus to some who are struggling with no real hope to some who are confused and angry and scared 
and, and have no one. In some cases, they don't even have people to help them through this. And for many, they certainly don't have God. Lord, help us to show the love of Christ as we have opportunity. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to minister your word to us. And, and even though, Lord, we haven't had a chance to look at those middle verses that tell us more about you, we pray that you would fill our minds with those meditations even this week, that your mercy reaches to the heavens and that we can find comfort and shelter under the shadow of your wings. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And this morning, I am going to go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 for our benediction. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and this is verses 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Amen. God bless.